Mole used to work the passenger lift in the Empire Hotel in West 63rd Street, New York. He had served his time in the army and got his discharge with good conduct stripes and got the job because his late colonel was one of the retired officers on the hotel's managing committee. He had asked his good-tempered superior about getting a job and been accepted after the last operator had been sacked. He liked his work well enough and the pay and kept his place for a year although should have been there longer if it hadn't been for a certain circumstance. The lift was hydraulic so ran smoothly and was as safe as standing on the ground. A child could have worked it. It was like a small sitting room with red velvet cushions and mirrors all around and would float you up or down as light as a bird. Mole was in charge of the lift from noon to midnight, a busy time with visitors constantly going up or down and the electric bell frenetically ringing him from one floor to another. Then came a quiet spell while dinner was on. Mole prided himself on always noticing faces as people got into the lift, having sharp sight and a good memory. None of the visitors needed to tell him where to take them as he knew them and their floor as well as they did themselves. He particularly noticed Colonel Saxby when he came to the hotel in November. He could see at once that he was a soldier, a tall, thin man of about 50, with a hawk nose, green eyes and a grey moustache. He walked stiffly from a gunshot wound in the knee, but what Mole noticed most was a sabre cut across the right side of his face. Colonel Saxby's room number was 210, just opposite the glass door leading to the lift, and every time Mole stopped on the fourth floor, number 210 stared him in the face. The Colonel used to go up in the lift regularly, every day, and sometimes when he was alone in the lift, he would speak to Mole, asking him in what regiment he had served and saying he knew the officers in it. Mole actually did not find him comfortable to talk to, that there was something standoff about him and that he always seemed deep in his own thoughts. He never sat down in the lift, empty or full, but always stood bolt upright under the lamp where the light fell on his pale face and scarred cheek. One day in February, Mole didn't take the colonel up in the lift and noticed it because he was usually as regular as clockwork. Supposing he had gone away for a few days, he thought no more of it, and whenever he stopped on the fourth floor, the door of 210 was shut. As the colonel often left it open, he was sure the man had gone away, until, after a week, he heard a chambermaid say that Colonel Saxby was ill. That explained why he had not been in the lift lately. It was a Tuesday night and uncommonly busy, with a continuous stream of traffic up and down throughout the evening. Close to midnight, Mole was about to put out the light in the lift, lock the door and leave the key in the office for the morning operator when the electric bell rang out sharp. He looked at the dial and saw that he was wanted on the fourth floor. It struck 12 as he stepped into the lift. As he passed the second and third floors, he wondered who had rung so late, perhaps a stranger who didn't know the rule of the house. But when he stopped at the fourth floor and flung open the lift door, Colonel Saxby was standing there, wrapped in a military cloak. The door of his room, 210, was shut behind him. Having thought the Colonel ill in his bed, Mole noticed that he still looked ill enough but was wearing his hat. Mole wondered why a man who had been in bed ten days would want to go out on a winter midnight. When he set the lift in motion, he observed the colonel standing beneath the lamp with the shadow of his hat hiding his eyes, but the light full on the lower half of his face, showing it to be deadly pale, the scar on his cheek even paler. Mole commented that he was glad to see the colonel better, but received no reply. He felt the man had not even noticed him, standing like a statue with his cloak about him. Mole was relieved when they reached the ground floor, saluting the colonel as he got out and went past him towards the front door. Mole informed the door porter, Joe, that the colonel wished to go out. Joe stood staring as he opened the door and Colonel Saxby walked out into the snow. Mole and Joe expressed their concerns to each other that he was ill enough to be in his bed but going out on such a night. The porter commented that at least he had his famous cloak to keep him warm. Perhaps he was going to a fancy ball and needed the cloak to hide his dress. 
Both men laughed uneasily, but felt strangely unnerved. As they spoke, there came a loud ring at the doorbell. No more passengers for me, said Mole, and was really putting out the light this time when Joe opened the door and two people entered. Mole knew at a glance they were doctors. Both came up to the lift as Mole apologised and explained that it was against the hotel rule for the lift to go up after midnight. The two men objected, protesting that it was only just after 12 and they were concerned with a matter of life and death. They demanded to at once be taken to the fourth floor. They were in the lift like a shot, so Mole took them up, and when he opened the door, they walked straight to number 210. A nurse came to meet them, as one asked, No change for the worst, I hope. Her reply shocked Mole. The patient died five minutes ago, sir. Although aware that he had no business to speak, that was more than Mole could stand. He followed the doctors to the door and told them that there must be some mistake, that he had taken the colonel down in the lift since the clock struck twelve and he had gone out. One of the doctors sharply told him that this was a case of mistaken identity. It had been someone else that he mistook for the colonel. Begging the doctor's pardon, Mole insisted that it had indeed been Colonel Saxby himself and that the night porter who opened the door for him knew him just as well as he that he was dressed for a night like this, with his military cloak wrapped around him. The nurse suggested to Mole that he step into the room and see for himself. He followed the doctor into the room to see Colonel Saxby looking just as he had seen him a few minutes before. But there he lay, dead as his forefathers, and the great cloak spread over the bed to keep him warm, he who would feel heat and cold no more. Mole never slept that night, but sat up with Joe, expecting every minute to hear the colonel ring the front door bell. The next day, every time the bell for the lift rang, sharp and sudden sweat broke out on him, and he started shaking again. He and Joe told the manager all about it, and he said that they had been dreaming, but warned them not to talk about it, or the hotel would be empty within the week. Mole helped the manager and undertakers to smuggle the coffin in that night, taking it up in the lift and into number 210. But a strange feeling came over him when the four men finally set the coffin down at the door of the lift and the manager looked around for his help again. I can't do it, sir, Mole protested. He said that he couldn't take the colonel down again. He had taken him down at midnight yesterday and that was enough for him. The men pushed the coffin into the lift without a sound. The manager got in last, and before he closed the door, he turned to Moll and sharply told him that he had worked the lift for the last time. That was all right by Moll, as he would not have stayed on at the Empire Hotel, even if they had doubled his wages. Both he and Joe the night porter left together.